So there are certain offices that are given uh, to the body of Christ according to Ephesians chapter 4. Um, I, I want to talk about three of them very quickly uh, because they represent anointings that are very present in this house in Jubilee. Uh, first of all, there is uh, what we would refer to as a teaching anointing. And in my opinion, Jubilee Christian Center has some of the best teachers in our nation. And a teaching anointing gives you insight, right? A teaching anointing gives you insight. Um, an apostolic anointing gives you oversight, right? Yes, and then a prophetic anointing gives you foresight. So all of these anointings require certain responses, right? So if you're sitting under teaching and you're receiving insight you want to have your notebook ready and you want to write down those foundational points because the teaching gift is a building gift right teaching is building always the prophetic gift and i noticed what pastor charlton said this morning he said finally i just gave up and i decided just to lean into it instead of trying to take notes the prophetic anointing runs in the pace of revelation so revelation is equivalent to illumination illumination is equivalent to light the speed of light is the fastest thing we know. So revelation, prophetic anointings run very quick. So a lot of times when a prophetic anointing is in the pulpit, you have to do exactly what Pastor Charlton said. You can take notes to the best of your ability, but sometimes it's maybe better just to go back and get the DVD or, or watch it on the archive, you know, on, on, the, on the website or Facebook. Uh, and that's what's going to happen today. So I'm not going to apologize for the speed I'm about to hit, okay? Because what we're about to do is allow Revelation to run its course through the sanctuary at a very fast pace. And uh, what I want you to do is engage your mind and engage your spirit. As a man thinketh, so is he. The word thinketh means to estimate, estimation. But it all also means to look for splits or openings. So today, God's going to uh, drop portals out of eternity into time. Meaning there are going to be doors of destiny that's going to appear before you as I preach this morning. So you're going to see yourself go from room to room. You're going to see yourself passing from one phase of purpose to the next phase of purpose. By the end of this message, you're not just going to be charged and challenged, but you're going to be changed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen to that? So I said all that to say... There are really only two kinds of services. There are what we call observation or spectator services where you're, you're a spectator. You watch and you're entertained. But then there are participatory services, which means you are now a participant in the service and you're not just looking at the platform uh, to receive a performance, right? So I'm not here to perform today. I'm here to speak prophetically into your purpose, okay? So when you hear something that resonates with you, you might want to respond like, go ahead and preach, Bishop, or bring the word, Bishop, or, you know, elbow somebody next to you, and, you know, not, not really, but uh, as a matter of fact, let's practice. Jump on your feet and high five three people and tell them it's on in the building right now. Let's practice. Just tell them it's on in the building right now. Amen. So let's remain standing. Let's remain standing now. And I, I'm not going to read very much. I'm going to read three chapters out of the Bible. And then we're going to sit. I'm just, I'm just being uh, frivolous for a moment. But Genesis chapter 49 and verse number 18. I'm going to read two passages of scripture, two verses. And we're going to take off running. Okay. Somebody shout, I'm ready. Now just nudge your neighbor and tell them, put your seatbelt on. Here we go. Amen. Now, you know what? Something powerful is going to happen. I feel it right now. I really do. I really feel it. Um, verse number 18, Genesis chapter number 49, verse 18. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. He shall overcome overcome when at the, last. at the last i'm gonna preach a message this morning real quick two hours and 45 minutes <laughs> i love y'all the message entitled victory at last victory at last 
Now go ahead and high five three people one more time and tell them victory at last. Let, and then let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. And we ask you uh, to enlighten the eyes of our understanding today as this word goes forth. Because you said, Jesus, what we understand cannot be taken from us. And we acknowledge today, Lord, that knowledge is education and, and understanding is revelation and wisdom is application. So as we preach today, we pray for understanding. Let us see behind the scenes today. And we give you praise for everything you've ever done in our life. We thank you for every victory and every triumph. And Lord, right now, we're going to give you praise for the victories we've not yet seen. And the triumphs we are yet to enjoy. Everybody in the building, clap your hands and shout to God with a voice of triumph. Because your future, your future is looking great right now. Come on, tell somebody, your future looks so good, you ought to have sunglasses on. Amen. Amen. Can I do one more thing? Lift those hands. I break every generational curse in this building. And I dismiss every generational spirit in this building. Father, we thank you that you are obliterating every distraction and any obstacle that has been erected in our prophetic purpose and future in this earth. And we thank you, Lord, that you are shattering everything that will try to stop us from enjoying the full efficacy of who you preordained us to be before we arrived. Today, Lord, we're going to step into it in Jesus' name. Come on, y'all. Give him praise like, he, like you really love him with your heart. Bless your name, Jesus. Amen. You, you, you may be seated. God bless you. You know, I was thinking about this, and, and 2017 has been a very interesting year. Wouldn't you agree with me? Yes, now, I was telling the first service that everything is tense. Every, there's so much tension in every area of our society. In every realm of this generation, the main characteristic would be that of tension, right? So everything seems to be very tense at this, at this time. And I'm thinking about where we are in this year. And as we crossed over into October of 2017, and I'm just speaking to you as I feel like the Lord is speaking to me, that October, November, December would be the fourth quarter of the year. Now, if you know anything about football, you'll see all the players when the fourth quarter hits, they hold four fingers up like this is our quarter, right? And I just came by to tell you, welcome to the fourth quarter. It's not the first quarter, second quarter, or third quarter. It's the last quarter. And you're about to see victories in your life in the fourth quarter that you did not see in the first three quarters. Stuff you've been praying about for a long time is going to happen real fast. Because God is about to add velocity to your vision. And he's about to add a speed to your purpose in the earth. Come on, shout, my answer's on its way now. Amen. Right now, amen. So you're in the, in the fourth quarter. And I was thinking about um, how God saves the last for himself. So even when he began certain things, the prophet Isaiah said he gives that thing an end and then starts it with a beginning. So it's over before he starts. You were finished before you were saved. Paul said, I learned a lot of stuff, but I'm confident of one thing, that he who began a good work in you shall also complete it. Why? Because it was already finished before it ever started. So it don't matter what you feel like or what you're going through, be encouraged. Because the end of a thing is always better than the beginning thereof. So what I'm trying to tell you is things are getting brighter and brighter. We move from glory to glory, and we move from faith to faith. And I came to move you from your last encouragement to your next encouragement. You're going to walk out of this building with your shoulders square, with a strut in your stride, stepping like you know where you're going. Come on, tell somebody, it's on in here right now. In Jesus' name. So when Jesus works his first miracle, he does it in a last mode. So he turns the water into wine, and then the governor said that they came to the governor and said, "You saved the best for last." So now, now that Kenosi idea 
that when Jesus is doing a thing, he really shows off at the end. Y'all not hear me right there. In other words, as it gets toward the end, things get better and better. And why? Because God saves the best for last. I don't know about y'all, but I believe we're real close to the last generation. So we must be the best thing God had to offer. Come on, ask somebody, how does it feel to be the best thing God has to offer? Lord Jesus. So when we talk about 17 and 2017, it's very important prophetically. And I remember being here earlier in the year, and I kind of went through some of these things with you. But for example, Scripture refers to God as being a unique God uh, in Hebrew vocabulary, 17 different times in the Bible. Does the Bible refer to God as being a unique God? So a unique God means he does unusual things, things that you cannot predict. Woo, let me, I feel this flow right here. I'm gonna work this current for a minute. So he is able to do exceeding abundant above all that you can ask or think. So once you set your expectation here, that's a good job because God's going to supersede what you expected him to do. Can I go ahead and prophesy October, November, and December are going to be the best months you've seen in a long time? October is going to be real good, but it ain't going to compare to December. Tell somebody by the end of December, my life's going to be different. Y'all give God a sanctified praise. Come on, clap your hands and shout to God with a voice of triumph. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. So, so then when you look at the number 17, um, it's very, very powerful because the number 17 is the number of victory or the number of overcoming. So when we read our text that A troop shall overcome Gad, but Gad shall overcome when? At the last. last. Say it again. Victory Victory. at last. last. Some of y'all been battling some battles all year long, been waiting for victory. Fourth quarter is here. There's about to be a turnaround, and victory is on your doorstep. So let let me get through this part here. Man, I feel good about it. Amen. Feel good about it. Bless your name, Jesus. You know the devil know he in trouble today. Them demons been haunting and taunting you are in trouble today. Principalities, powers, and rulers in heavenly places are shaking in their boots right now because of what you are about to receive from the Lord Almighty. So 17 is the number of victory and is the number of overcoming. So how do we get that? And I'm going to explain it to you very quickly. So the 17th letter in the Hebrew alphabet is the letter Pei, P-E-Y. You would pronounce it P-A-Y, Pei. And it means the area of the mouth or the region of the jaw. So the 17th letter. So here, I'm going to show it to you and ask them to bring this whiteboard out here uh, for a five-second illustration. That's a lot of whiteboard to do something in five seconds. But so if you drew out the 17th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, here's how it would look. And you would have to start here. And you go this way, and then you come down. And this is all one stroke. This is all one stroke. And when you start back here, and it really takes on more of a of a formation of a circle than a square, all right? But when you almost get to the end, right here, okay, there is this little maneuver that the Hebrew writer has to make. And the maneuver is like this. That is a seven. Gad is the seventh child. So right before the end is over, God provides a way out of distress. 
When it looked like you were almost defeated, God throws a seven in there. Because Gad will overcome right before he's defeated. So when you look at the 17th letter and you realize it is a number of victory and a number of overcoming, a number of coming out. Woo. Then you have to realize that when you talk about this son called Gad and how Gad is an overcomer, you have to ask yourself, where did this prophecy come from? What is the Bereshith or the beginning of this particular prophecy? When you look, and, and let me say this, I just looked down at my notes and I thought of this too. This right here, to the Hebrew mindset, oh Lord help me today. It means mouth, this is the mouth. And it means to exhale in order to scatter, mm, Lord, 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 the enemy. Can we get spiritual for a moment and jump on our feet, take a deep breath. Come on, inhale. And then on three, you're going to exhale with a shout. And the enemy is going to scatter. Ready? One, two, three. I'm feeling this thing right here. So they overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Now open your mouth one more time and give God praise for everything he ever brought you through. Come on, shout to him. Lord, I love you with all my heart. All right, let's work this thing for a moment. Everyone say the overcomer's prophecy. You may be seated. The prophecy is a proclamation or a blessing. So in Genesis chapter number 49, we see Jacob saying, gather my sons, verse number one and two, that I may tell them what shall befall them when? In the last days. When Jacob is at the end of his life, he gathers all the sons around his bed and he begins to prophesy to them or to proclaim to them what's going to happen to them. Amen. But you've got to understand that when he prophesies to them, and you've got to do the Hebrew etymology because it's beautiful, it literally means he predicts to them the future that they're going to have. Prediction means words before something comes to pass. You have the ability to predict your own future. The power is in your mouth. What you say is ultimately what you're going to see. If you keep saying I'm broke and I'm busted and disgusted, guess what you're going to be? Broke, busted, and disgusted. But when you start saying I'm blessed and highly favored, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm in front, not behind. I'm healed. I'm not sick. I'm prosperous. I don't live in poverty. I'm anointed. I'm appointed, I'm deputized, I'm authorized, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I have power, I have potential, I have purpose, I have a prophetic future. What are you doing? You are predicting, your, you are filling your world with words of prophecy. And I came by to tell you, don't let anybody else sit in the seat of authority with a narrative over your seed and your children. You go in your children's bedroom and you prophesy. If you got to do it while they are asleep, baby, stretch your hand over them and say, you're going to be a mighty man of God. You're going to be a man of purpose. You're going to be a man of deliverance. You're going to be a man of healing. And you prophesy over your children. 
So prophecy all through scripture is reserved for patriarchs. Patriarchs are heads of family units. It is high time for us to recognize spiritual fathering. Paul told the church at Corinth, you got 10,000 teachers, but you don't have any spiritual fathers. He said that's dangerous. Why? Because the prediction of a prophetic future must be uttered from somebody in authority and influence over your life. So why do you come to church Sunday after Sunday to hear Bishop Dick Burnell prophesy over you? What's he doing? He's just preaching and teaching. But what's he making you believe? That life's going to get better and better and better and better. And I came today to prophesy to you that if the devil could have taken you out, he would have already taken you out. You are alive because you have a bright future and your best is yet to come. You've not seen anything yet. God is about to move you to the next level of living you're about to move into the blessed life because it's the best life you've not become the best person you can possibly be you've not done the best things you can possibly do somebody shout the best is yet to come so he says that I may tell them it's an impartation it's a transference so when you sit under spiritual authority, you are receiving a transference of something. Elisha received a transfer from Elijah's mantle. You can't receive a transfer from something you're not following. In other words, you gotta be connected enough to receive it. And I came by to preach to people who are connected in the house to tell you there's an impartation that is important to your destiny. It's coming your way. You're going to receive it. You're going to believe it. You're going to... Somebody shout, my life is looking better every moment. Let me show you. Jacob got so excited showing about prophesying to Gad that he gets to his sixth son, Dan, or, or his fifth son, Dan, and he skips the sixth son to get to the seventh son. Because he was so excited about what he saw in Gad that he held the, the sixth son to the last position because he, watch what he prays. He prophesies five times and then he says, I've waited for your deliverance, oh God. And he looked right at Gad. And he said, you're going to be overcome. You're going to lose some battles. But when everybody, I hear you in the back, talk to me like that and I'll preach like a crazy man. <laughs> oh Lord. Don't talk back to me like that, honey. I'll preach, I'll run around this building. <laughs> Woo, Lord have mercy. So he said, but right at the end, when it looks like it's over, you're going to overcome. Somebody shout, I'm an overcomer. Now let me show you something. That's the overcomer's prophecy, but the overcomer's profession is on this wise. A profession is a declaration of truth, not a declaration of fact. God ain't ever ask you how you feel before he tells you to do something. He don't ask you, do you feel like doing what I'm about to tell you to do? Because God don't check feeling, he checks faith. And I came by here with a faith check. See if you got enough faith to believe God for a bright future. Do you have enough faith that things are about to get better and things are about to turn around? Tell somebody it's getting better by the minute, honey. I came looking for a declaration of truth, not a declaration of fact. And here's the truth. Revelation 12, 10. We have overcome him. Have overcome. By the blood of the lamb. And by the word of our testimony. 
word of our testimony. Whew. When you look at Gad, and I don't have time to preach this whole thing. We're going to be here at 2.30 if I do, but I ain't going to do that because I want to come back. When you look at Gad, the tribe of Gad and the territory they inhabited as their inheritance, in Numbers chapter 32, the Bible says they chose the land of Gilead. Gilead was a fertile region that looked like a feudal region. It was rocky and it, no one really wanted it. But Gad said, I'll take the rough land. The Bible says when Gad took the land, it became the most fruitful place to raise cattle. Because God chooses places and people that look like they washed up to do one more move. And I came by to tell you, Gilead means, the reason why God chose Gilead is because Gilead means a pile or a heap of testimonies. There are people in this building, you don't have one testimony, you don't have two testimonies. Your testimony is not when you got saved, your testimony is the last time God delivered you from something. In other words, there could have been a wreck that killed you, but you're still here. There could have been a disease that was passed down to you, but it bypassed you, and you're still here. I don't know how many testimonies y'all got, but when I look back over my life, I got a mountain, I got a pile, I got a heap of testimonies. Because God don't pull you out one time, God pulls you out every time. I dare you to look back over your life today and begin to give him praise for all the times he brought you out. All the times he brought you over. All the times he brought you through. The test you in now is going to serve as a testimony. What you're going through now is giving you another word of victory. Somebody shout, I got something to say. Yeah, and you do. A testimony has to come from a witness or the subject. When you give a testimony in court to testify, you can't testify unless you're a witness. You either had to see it or you had to be it. I don't care if nobody saw it. I'm the subject. And you can't tell me what God has done for me. You were not there when I should have died, but I kept on living. You were not there when they should have locked me up, but God gave me a pass. Tell somebody I got a testimony. You were not there when I almost lost my mind because I lost everything else, but God preserved me. That's my testimony. And I don't know what your testimonies are, but I'm gonna give you 15 seconds to give God a crazy praise for whatever testimony you have. Come on, shout to him because he has blessed you. Can I go ahead and make a prediction? Here's, a, here's your prediction. If he's done it before, what makes you think he's not going to do it again? If he delivered you time and time and time in your past, it don't matter what's in your future, you're gonna be delivered from that as well. <laughs> Sit on down one more time. I feel the Lord in this place. So he gets to Gad and the overcomer's prophecy is this. You're going to lose some battles. You're not going to lose the war. It's going to look like you defeated, but at the very end, 
Gad, you're going to win. Because seven belongs to God. He worked six days, he rested on the seventh day. Joshua sends the Israelites to march around Jericho. How many days? Seven days. And on the seventh day, how many times? Seven times. Why? Because seven belongs to God. Seven always wins. Seventeen is a combination of ten, spiritual order, and seven, spiritual perfection. God told me to tell you that this is the year that he perfects spiritual order in your life. Everything that's been chaotic is about to become cosmos. Everything that's been operating in entropy is about to be operating in a stillness that builds a confidence in you. Everything that looks like it's been out of order and out of control is coming under complete dominion because you have a word in your mouth and God is about to anoint you to speak to the mountain and tell it be removed and it's going to be removed. God's going to bring order out of chaos. The seventh day, the seventh day belongs to God. Even God acts different on the seventh day. He worked on six days, seven day. He rested. You know what you did this week? Prayerfully, you worked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but today. You said this is God's day. You got up out your bed. You put your heels on, did your hair, put your lipstick on, did your eyelashes and your eyebrows. Put your dress on, checked yourself, and came to the house of God. Why? Because this is God's day. And when you give him his day, he begins to do stuff in your life that you can't even imagine. And I came by to tell you, thank you for giving him number seven, because he's about to give you a blessing that's going to take you out of where you've been. Somebody shout like you know God is changing things right now. Bless his name. So that's overcomers prophecy, the overcomers profession. Now watch this. The last one and I'm done. But I'm going to shame the devil real good on this one. Hmm. Yes. Y'all better stop talking to me like that. Hmm. The overcomer's practice. All right. The overcomer's practice. Come on. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. The old axiom says, practice makes, makes perfect. perfect. That's right. This is a new axiom. Practice makes permanent. Oh. There's something powerful, and I've been sharing this with Pastor Josh, the revelation God gave me yesterday. There's something powerful about predictability. Amen. Come on, Bishop. Yeah. See, when we are unpredictable in life, we stifle spontaneity. Okay. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. When you live predictable, devotional lives, you allow God opportunity to do spontaneous things. But if you live your life from one emotional event to the next, looking for anything spontaneous, then you're going to wear yourself out and lose energy waiting for the next great event. You're going to run out of gas. But if you're faithful about pulling over to the pump, if you are predictable in your purpose, in other words, God ain't got a word about you because he knows you are permanent in what he's called you to do. Then you sling open the door of heavenly privilege and God can send you surprises that will blow your natural mind. Practice makes permanent. 
Permanent is everlasting, especially without significant change. Whew. Can I tell you, you are here today because you refuse to allow the things you cannot change to change you. Feel that thing, man. Don't allow, don't allow stuff you can't change to change you. Don't allow people you can't change to change you. I'm going to take it one step further. Everybody got haters. Let them hate. You just keep on doing what God called you to do. My Bible says, beware when all men speak well of thee. Somebody ought to be hating on you because you're doing it so right. And I can tell you something right now. Favor always brings out jealousy in other people. It's coming to me. Thank you, Lord, for the download. You remember them fellas that was hired for one hour? And it was the 11th hour. And them other people been working all day. And they all, most, they all got paid what? The same. And what happened? The ones that were working for 11 hours got mad at the ones that worked for one hour and they received the same as the ones working for 11 hours. Why? Because God saves the last hour for himself. And his favor on your life is going to expose the sin in somebody else's life. It's going to expose the jealousy in other people. No, you ain't worked as hard as everybody else, but you showed up at the 11th hour. Favor on Joseph made his brothers manifest who they really were. Favor on David made his brothers manifest who they really were. Favor on your life is going to give you the discernment to recognize who's with you and who's not with you. And if they're not with you, just smile at them and say, later, Gator, I got to keep on doing what God called me to do. Give him a praise right there. Permanent, intended to exist or function for a long time. You're not just here, but you're functioning. Indefinite period without regard to unforeseeable conditions. Long lasting, non fading, permanent means to remain. It's very akin to the word persevere, per, see, severe, severity, the ability to remain in the face of severe conditions. So no matter how severe the circumstance is, you are permanent. You are planted. Those that be planted, Psalm 92, in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Folks, I'm just speaking this over your life. Quit allowing everything to throw you every kind of way. One day you in, one day you out. One day you up, one day you down. One day you, you know, I'm in this thing. Next day we can't find you. Come on, tell your neighbor, plant yourself. Be permanent in your purpose. Don't let stuff shake you. Glory to God. God is good. Is he not? One more, I'm going to hit you with this in a mouth. Because the devil know he in trouble. Come on. You know what? As I speak this last part of this message, cycles that have been acting like a vortex pulling you down in your life is about to reverse. Wow. I'm going to go ahead and predict that right now. Things that have been pulling you down is going to begin to reverse and start sending you up. Somebody shout, my promotion is right before me. So the Gadites in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, and re remember what Jacob said, you're going to be overcome, but you will overcome at last. The Gadites in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, what time this service ends? Be real with me now, don't y'all give me fire now. 
Sarah. What time does it end, Sarah? I got 10 minutes. Thank you. If I do this in 10 minutes, you're going to know there's a God in heaven. He says, the Gadites, and I don't have time to read it, when they came to David in the stronghold, watch what the Bible says. It says they were men of war, fit for the battle. They were men of war, fit for the battle. One version says they were men of might. The word might in Hebrew is force, virtue, and wealth. You shall overcome them at the last. Wow. So obviously these men of Gad had substance. That's right. So they didn't come to the king empty handed. That's right. They came to the king with an ability to persevere. Come on, sir. They came to the king with a prophecy from their past that said, I'm going to ultimately be an overcomer. Uh -huh. Ultimately, I'm going to win this victory. Right. I'm going to go through some battles. I'm going to lose some fights. But don't count me out in the 11th round because I got knocked down. Because I got one more round left in me. And it ain't going to take but one punch to overcome this enemy. And I came by to tell you, you about to throw, throw a praise punch that's going to knock the devil plumb out your destiny. Don't get sad. So the word fit means three things. Number one, they were prepared. Physically, mentally, and spiritually prepared. Prepared is not getting ready. Prepared is being ready. A few decades ago, we heard a prophetic word come out of the mouth of a prophet saying, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Now, the word of the Lord is not get ready, get ready. The word of the Lord is stay ready, stay ready. Be prepared. Be instant, in season and out of season. Be instant in the daytime. Be instant in the nighttime. Be instant when you got a lot. Be instant when you ain't got very much. Be prepared at all times. Preparation is everything. Preparation is everything. See, you should be preparing yourself for your prophetic future. And let me help you. You can't live in your prophetic future acting like you've been acting your whole life. Preparation never stops. Preparation is part of process. Man, I wish I had time. If you bypass the process, you become a byproduct. Number one, be prepared. Number two, be punctual. Punctual. It means timely. The Lord spoke to me this morning and told me to tell you that your vocabulary should be filled with these words. Time. Times. Timing. And timely. Let me say it again. Time. Times. Timing. And timely. The Bible says the mighty men understood the times. Open your eyes and realize the time we're living in is a time we've never seen. Are you prepared? Be timely. How can you lead people to a place you have not been? How can you expect people to be timely when you're not timely yourself? Punctual means to be on time. To be on time, you must understand timing. To everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Time is kairos. It is a set appointment. If you're not punctual, your appointment for promotion can show up and you missed it because time means nothing to you. Oh, I know I'm on your, on your big toe right now. But I'm going to work on this big toe for a minute. Because this generation is not a generation that understands how important timeliness, timing, time is. 
Let me tell you the importance of time. Time is more valuable than money. You can recover money, but you can't recover time. Talk back to me. You can't waste time. Time is your most important ass ass asset. So if you're timely and you understand the timing, it's impossible for you to miss your time. God's showing up with a moment for you to take you to a place you've never been. But if you're not punctual, you're going to miss it. I am preaching good. I, I want to slap myself behind my own head. The last thing fit means is to be perpetual. It has to do with duration. I have waited for your salvation. Finally, it's come. You will overcome at the last. Come here, Pastor Charlton, real quick. And, and we're going to end this thing. So, you face this battle a hundred times. Come on, come to me. You're the battle and just run into me and you overcome me. Go back. Same thing happens. You come, it faces you, it hits you, and it overcomes you. But Gad, this time, it's going to hit you, and it's going to look like it overcame you. Watch. Go by me. But you are going to grab him by his heel. You're going to catch him just before he gets away. And you're going to bring him back. And you're going to say, not this time. The last time was the last time. I came to tell you, catch your enemy by the heel and tell him, get back in front of me because that was your last time to defeat me. That was your last time to overcome me. That was your last battle you will ever win. If that's your word, jump on your feet and praise the Lord like you know God has given you victory. Shout, I will overcome at the last. <laughs> Revelation 2, 7, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. Revelation 2, 11, he who overcomes will not be hurt. Revelation 2, 17, he who overcomes, I will give the hidden manna in heaven and give him a white stone with a new name. Revelation 2, 26, to him who overcomes and, and does my will to the end, I will give authority over all nations. Revelation 3, 5, to him who overcomes, I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but I will acknowledge him before my father and his angels. Revelation 3, 12, to him who overcomes, Comes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Revelation 3.21 To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Revelation 21.17 To him who overcomes, they will inherit all of this. And I will be his God and he will be my child. I came by to tell you, you lost some battles, but you're not going to lose the war. It's your time. God saved you for the last. It's the fourth quarter. If this is your word, run to this altar right now. You say, Bishop, something you said hit me. It hit me, and I'm glad to know that I will have victory at last. I will have victory at last. I will overcome. Finally, I will overcome. I will overcome in the fourth quarter of this year. I will overcome when time is running out on the clock. I will overcome when it looks like I'm knocked out. I got one more punch left in me. I got one more praise. I got one more worship. I got one more opportunity. Somebody shout, I'm not over. I'm overcoming. I hear the Holy Spirit saying this, finally. I hear him just saying it over, over and over, finally, finally, finally. And I hear God telling me to tell you, finally, you're going to get your victory today. That devil has hit you with that for the very last time. 
Somebody shout, not again. God is good. Can I remind you of a Super Bowl? Just last, when was that, January, February? Can I remind you what the Patriots look like? Can I remind you of a scene in the fourth quarter where Tom Brady walked down that bench and put his finger in every one of his players' faces and said, we are not finished. We are going to win this game. And the greatest comeback in sports history happened in the fourth quarter. Because somebody said, finally, shouted, finally. What did Jesus say when he won the victory on the cross? It, thank you. It is finally. It's over. Can I tell you the same victory that was won on that cross is your victory today. Lift those hands. Father, I rebuke depression, oppression, anxiety attacks, panic disorders, erratic nervous conditions. I stand against fear. I rebuke all trepidation. I rebuke every phobia and I speak to these people that God has not given you the spirit of fear but of power love and a sound mind and I declare truth over your life and this is your profession <laughs> that what you've been fighting from January to September ends now because from October to December, you're going to walk in victory and overcoming day after day. Every addiction is broken now. Every curse broken now. Every spirit that's not of God is dismissed now. I want you to shout, I'm a winner. Now look at three people and profess that. How does it feel to stand next to an overcomer? As a matter of fact, high five them and tell them you can call me Gad for the rest of the day. My name will just be Gad all day today. Now I'll go back to my other name tomorrow, but today my name is Gad. Come on, high five somebody and tell them what's up Gad? What's up Gad? Amen, because we overcome at the last. I love y'all with all of my heart. Pastor Charlton is going to come and dismiss us. Just remain where you are. And I'm going to run to the foyer because I want to shake your hand. If I'm going to be a part of the family, I want to even know your name. Right? And I'll be in and out of here as my bishop tells me. But I love you all. And hey, can I tell you thank you? A brother like this brother with the tie. and the glass. You make a preacher want to preach, man. Keep, keep doing what you do. Because it brings something out. You know what I'm saying? Amen. Amen. And thank y'all for making me feel so welcome. Amen. Amen. Can we thank the bishop? Come on, let's put our hand together. Thank Bishop Rick. Amen. Really quickly, can we just say, just stand still for the next, just two minutes, really quick. Eyes closed, head bows. No one moving around right now, but there might just be one person in this place that says, you know what, today I need to invite Jesus into my life. Come on, you heard about destiny. There were so many things that Bishop spoke today about. Here's the deal. The key that unlocks it is giving your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're not walking with Him today, but you're saying, today's my day. i got to come back home. As every eye is closed and head is bowed, if that's you right now, the sound of my voice. It might just be one person, but maybe it's two. I don't know. God knows. But there's a tugging on your heart right now, and you know it's you I'm talking to. If that's you, eyes are closed, heads bowed, no one moving around. Why don't you raise your hand quick? We want to pray for you today. i got one hand right here. Anybody else today? I see you in the back there. Beautiful. Anybody else that say, you know what? He's not just Savior today. I need Him to be the Lord of my life. I need Him to be my shepherd today. If that's you, really quick. Don't want to miss anybody. Hand, raise your hand really quick. We're going to pray. The Bible says, if you believe. I see you up top there. Beautiful. If you believe in your heart today, the Bible says, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. The Bible says you will be saved. Not you might be, not you could be. You will be saved. That means today when we pray, 
you are going to be a child of God, my friend, and He's going to be shepherd. I see you, my brother, beautiful. And I want you to do is your hand. If you raise your hand, I want you to keep it raised really quickly. Our ushers are going to put a card in your hand, and that card is yes to Jesus. And what I want you to do is I want you to take that card, and after service, I'm going to be in the lobby area. I want you to fill that card out and give it to me. Why? Because we do life together. When you give your life to Jesus, He plants you in a family. This is your family here at Jubilee Christian Center. And so if you got your hand, you got that card, I want to meet you after service service in our lobby area. Yeah, we're going to do right now. We're going to pray. I'm going to ask for everybody to pray together and we're going to seal this because if you believe and you confess, you will be saved. So here we go. Repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you today for speaking to my heart. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of all my sins and I ask you, Jesus, to wash my life clean. I ask you, Jesus, to be my Lord and Savior. And I'm choosing this day to follow you, to live for you. I thank you, Jesus, that you are my shepherd, that you are my king. And I declare right now that I am a child of God, that Abba God is my father. I'm a child of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's give them the biggest hand right now.